We're looking at Thursday, October 25th. Make sure you're there in your notes, and we'll go from there. Now remember, the morning of Thursday, October 25th, 1962, National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy informed O'Donnell how upset the military was over the leak that came out in the paper that morning. Bundy explained to O'Donnell that they all knew it was, quote, Jack and Bobby behind the leak, and they were furious. And he pleads with O'Donnell, he said, quote, you got to stop it. We need you to talk to them. They will listen to you. And Bundy goes on to say that Jack and Bobby, quote, lack a moral toughness. And this statement makes O'Donnell very angry, and he implies to Bundy that he better refer to them as the president and the attorney general, and told him that he wouldn't be in the White House if it wasn't for the Kennedys. So he better kind of get his loyalty straightened out. Well, O'Donnell then met with President Kennedy alone and expressed his own displeasure with the decision to leak the information. He told the President there would be only one way the world would look at the leak, that we'd be selling out one of our friends for their own safety. And he even made the rude comment to President Kennedy, because he could, that this sounded like something his father would do. He said, what did you say? And he said, it was that idea, it was that effing bad. In other words, he, his father was an appeaser and he didn't like that. So that just showed some guts that O'Donnell felt like he could talk to the President of the United States and he was friends. Okay, I did mention yesterday that during this time right now, the United Nations Security Council was meeting to discuss the events in Cuba. And many members of the United Nations around the world were really questioning whether the United States' position on Cuba was correct or not. As a result, the United States would need to justify to the other countries around the world that they were justified in their ultimatums to the Soviet Union and their actions in Cuba. And so this is when Press Secretary Salinger urged President Kennedy to make arrangements for the photographs that our low-level flights had taken to be furnished to UN Ambassador Adlai Stevenson so when he went into the, the United Nations, he could confront the Soviet Union about proof that they did have evidence that they were doing that because nobody around the world knew of this proof. Now, many in the Kennedy administration had serious doubts that Stevenson had what it took to get support for the United States, didn't think he could take on the Soviet Union. Who was most concerned? Remember? Bobby. Bobby was most concerned. Now, here's where we start new. The Soviet ambassador at the United Nations was a fellow by the name of V. A. Zorin, and he was really a hard liner. I mean, he was a hard dude, and nobody thought Stevenson was strong enough to stand up to Zorn in front of the United Nations. And Bobby Kennedy really wanted to pull him and get a substitute in there, and President Kennedy refused. What he did, again, is he took his friend Kenneth O'Donnell, and he asked O'Donnell to give Stevenson a pep talk prior to his conversation with Zorn. Now, Stevenson's already at the United Nations meeting, so Kenneth O'Donnell called Stevenson on the phone. Adlai, oh hi Ken, wanted to have a word with you. He says, well I'm glad it's you, I was afraid it was, I'm glad it's you, I'm afraid it was, sorry, no, on the phone, Bobby, he was afraid Bobby was going to call and yank him off the details. So when Kenneth O'Donnell called him, he said, Ken, glad to see here it's you, I thought it would be Bobby. Here's the conversation between O'Donnell and Stevenson, this is O'Donnell's pep talk. You don't have to write it down, but please listen. O'Donnell says, Adelaide, the world has to know we're right. And if we're going to have a chance at a political solution, we are going to need international pressure. You got to be tough, Adelaide. You got to find it, buddy. And Adelaide's comment was, this is pretty good, I think. He said, he said to Kenneth O'Donnell, he says, I'm an old political cat, Kenny, but I've got one life left. And O'Donnell said, I know you do. And that was the end of the discussion. And Stevenson went back to the UN meeting to confront Zorin. So what now, did he say? What did who say? Hey, O'Donnell. O'Donnell said to him, Adelaide, the world has to know we're right if we're going to have a chance of a political solution. We are going to need international pressure. you got to be tough, Adelaide. you got to find it, buddy. And Stevenson's response was, I'm an old political cat, Kenny, but I've got one life left. And O'Donnell said, I know you do. And then he hung up, and Stevenson goes in to confront Zorn. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put your pencil down, 
And I want you just to listen to this conversation. I'm going to read it to you between Zorin and Stevenson. You'll get a chance to see it as well live, so to speak. So here is the following conversation between Stevenson and Zorin of the United Nations. Or not United, Soviet Union, the United Nations. Now, Stevenson comes in a little late and sets down while they're talking. What's he been doing? Prepping. Talking to O'Donnell. So he comes in and sets down. Here's what Zorin says. So listen up. What are you guys doing here? Okay, here's what Zorin said. We are very glad you could join us, Mr. Stevenson. For the last two hours, the entire world is asking only questions. The United States is pushing the entire world to the brink of catastrophe. The people of the world want to know why. We are told again and again about some incontrovertible evidence of offensive weapons in Cuba, but no evidence can be shown to us. Perhaps your spy planes are so secret that, you sim that you're simply incapable to present such evidence. Perhaps the United States of America is simply mistaken. Huh? And he says, and he's the chair, he says, the chair now recognizes the representative from the United States. So he gives him a little bit of a chewing, you know, for being late, and then... What do you, you know, where's your evidence here? Stevenson, right now they're nervous. They, don't, they think he's just going to fold. Stevenson says, well, let me say something to you, Mr. Ambassador. We do have the evidence. We have it, and it is clear and incontrovertible. Let me say something else. These weapons must be taken out of Cuba. You, the Soviet Union, have created this new danger, not the United States. Finally, Mr. Zorin, I remind you, that the other day you did not deny the existence of these weapons. But today, again, if I have heard you correctly, you now say they do not exist or that we haven't proved they exist. All right, sir, let me ask you one simple question. Do you, Ambassador Zorn, deny that the USSR has placed and is placing medium and intermediate range missiles and sites in Cuba? Yes or no? Don't wait for the translation. Yes or no, because they're translating everything. Zorn gets kind of offended. He says, I'm not in an American courtroom, sir, and therefore I do not wish to answer a question that is put to me in the fashion of which a prosecutor puts questions. In due course, sir, you will have your answer. At that point, everybody back at the White House is thinking that Stevenson's going to fold. And they're saying, don't let him off the hook, Adelaide, don't let him off the hook. And Stevenson responds, you are in the courtroom of world opinion right now, and you can answer yes or no. You have denied that they existed, and I want to know whether I have understood you correctly. This is all in front of the entire United Nations. Zorn says, continue with your statement. You will have your answer in due course. And again, they're worried about Stevenson letting them off the hook. And Stevenson says, I'm prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over. If that's your decision, that's a strong statement in those days, in the middle of a big UN meeting. And I'm also prepared, prepared to present the evidence in this room, the Soviet Union has lied to the world. Zorn gets frustrated, he's the chair of the committee, and he says, if you have decided not to continue your statement, the chair recognizes the representative from Chile. So he basically cuts Stevenson off before he can show the evidence and lets the representative from Chile speak. What do you think the representative from Chile did? From what? What did the representative from Chile do when he was given the floor? I want to see What did he do? I want to see well, what, so how did he do that? Now think about that. Think about that. He... Chile. Whatever. <laughs> he... Chile. Do you want to pronounce it? Chile. Chile. Okay, Chile. The representative... Okay, the representative from... Chile. From the... <laughs> Okay, if you have decided not to continue your statement, the chair recognizes the representative from? Chile. Okay. The representative from? Chile. Come on. The representative from? Chile. Chile. What did he do? What did he do? It's his turn to talk. What did he do? What can you do? Kretzer, you should know this. You're in this debate business. What can you do when you're given, when somebody recognizes you, what can you do if you want to? Pass it. Say nothing. The representative from Chile. Chile promptly gave his time back to Stevenson and the United States because, I don't remember who said it, Jack, maybe, he wanted to know, he wanted to see this evidence. 
So with that, Stevenson revealed the photographs of the Russian missiles and missile pads in Cuba. And with that revealing by Stevenson, the United States now had the support from the United Nations they needed. That was huge. Nobody thought Adlai Stevenson had the guts to do that. And he kicked butt and took names. So we moved to Friday, October 26th. We moved to Friday... October 26, and this pressure just never ends here, okay? On the morning of Friday, October 26, President Kennedy receives another phone call, again from McNamara at the Pentagon. Now, remember those six ships that were coming, four of which were a day away? They let the other two go, remember? Including the Bucharest? Well, of those four they were tracking, they lost one of them, one called the Grozny. Well, that's it. And President Kennedy says to McNamara, Mac, how the hell do you lose a ship? That's exactly what Kennedy said. So McNamara informs the president that during the night, the Navy, the Navy had lost location on one of the Soviet ships called the Grozny. And, the, and he further informed Kennedy that the ship had crossed the quarantine line that morning, had broken the line without permission. The president was annoyed, and just like Kylie said, the first thing he said to McNamara is, how the hell do you lose a ship? Okay? But they lost the ship, and he told McNamara to keep him posted. Now, I want, to, I want you to put this in perspective. You've got McNamara at the Pentagon with Admiral Anderson, whose job is to do what if a ship without permission crosses a quarantine? Right. No, we'll, get, we'll get to that, but what's it called? He's to follow the rules of engagement. We've talked about that. So at the Pentagon, Admiral Anderson contacted the Pierce, the captain of the Pierce, and he ordered them to follow the rules of engagement discussed earlier with XCOM. So what did the Pierce first try to do? Think about what we talked about. See if we can pick it up. What did the Pierce, what was their first step? Radio contact. Radio contact. Very good. Which they could not get. They had... Russian-speaking sailors trying to get not only radio contact, very good, Brittany, they also were doing, they were flashing the, you know, the light, the signal lights, trying to get their attention as well, to no avail. So what did Admiral Anderson do then? What was this next in the rules of engagement? The warning warning shot. Fired a warning shot over the bow. And he didn't fire a live shot, he fired a flare. Now flare is something that's going to go over the ship and Kind of like a, kind of like fireworks, but it was to get the you know try to get the attention. Now, when the shots were fired, McNamara went crazy. I mean, he got upset, and he ordered the firing to cease immediately. And Anderson and McNamara got involved in an incredibly heated verbal discussion. Okay, and McNamara was mad, and Anderson was mad. He finally told him. Mr. Secretary, get out of my way. Your actions are going to get some of my men killed. I mean, they got in this big altercation right in front of everybody in the Pentagon. And why was McNamara so mad? Uh, Think. What had Kennedy, we done? Did she, he, say, did she pass the right? line? Because yeah. Kennedy but did they even know Because Kennedy, Kennedy, President Kennedy said, there will be no firing on ships without... My explicit permission. Did Anderson have it? No. 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 And McNamara was, was uh, <laughs> upset, and he ended their confrontation by saying to Anderson that no further shots will be fired without his, McNamara's, explicit permission. And he further stated that I will be not giving you any permission until I get permission from the president. So he, it was quite a, quite a discussion, I'll tell you. So they quit the firing, but the flares did get the ship Grozny to what? Stop. Stop. So this is kind of ironic. So eventually a crew from the USS Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. searched for contraband military supplies on that ship, per the rules of engagement, and found nothing. As a result, they allowed the Grozny to go where? To, to Cuba. Cuba. But that happened at that time. So that was another thing Kennedy had to deal with. We lost a ship, found a ship, ships passed the quarantine line, we follow the rules of engagement, the, the Navy gets in trouble for firing upon that ship without the President's permission. It's quite a story. 
they finally do get the ship to stop. When they get the ship to stop, they do board it, a crew from the USS Joseph P. Kennedy Jr., which was also there, and they proceed, allowed it to proceed to that Cuba. Was, that was the ship they lost? That's the ship they lost, yeah. What are you doing there, girl? I think so. Let's not be texting. Show me. <laughs> I wrote it all down. Okay. I don't want to take it. I just want to make sure you're not texting. <laughs> Yes. One more time. Shh. Good question. For the people who surround him, they were not very. Well, the military was on it, and we're going to get it. That military was just yeah. against they lost him. the ship. They they oh. and they lost him. Yeah. A lot of people think they were really trying to set him up. Now, here's the thing that got kind of crazy this day. Here's how this day kind of ended in a way. It didn't end, but this is what happened right after that incident. Cuban leader Fidel Castro wrote a private letter to Khrushchev. So that day, during the crisis, Fidel Castro wrote a private letter to Premier Khrushchev. And Castro, in his letter, urged Khrushchev to initiate a nuclear first strike against the United States in case we invaded Cuba. So on that day, Castro urged, he didn't ask, he urged Khrushchev if the United States invades Cuba, I am asking you and urging you to initiate a nuclear first strike. That means we're sending nuclear weapons, the Soviet Union, toward the United States. If they invade. Castro was so afraid he was going to be invaded, he wanted Khrushchev to fire a first nuclear strike if that happened. Now that's getting pretty serious. How did it... Wait, after What's that? Go ahead. Okay, so when the ship crossed the quarantine line, was Adelai like giving this speech? Like, was this happening at the same Lot, time? Not, no, that actually happened after Adelai was done. Oh. Okay. Okay, it goes back and forth, but they were okay. Anyway, now here's the here is the whole key to this crisis. What did we say yesterday? What did President Kennedy and Premier Khrushchev find it difficult to do? Talk. Talk without what? Again. Without the military on their backs. Okay? So President Kennedy and Premier Khrushchev, this, during this whole crisis, are finding it very difficult to communicate directly with each other without the military breathing down their neck. So, as hard as this might be to believe, on this date, an incredible U-turn occurred that will solve the problem. Now, this is just an incredible story, and you can't even hardly understand how it could come to this. Kenneth O'Donnell walks into the Oval Office, and waiting at the Oval Office is an ABC News diplomatic correspondent, a news person, press guy, by the name of John Scally. He's waiting in Kennedy's office, and he wants to talk to the President. And O'Donnell gets upset because what's O'Donnell's title? He's the Appointments Secretary, and guess what? Scally has no what? And he's mad right away because he thinks that Scally's just busted in there to try to get some information to interview the president when he didn't get an appointment. So he, he kind of gets after him. What are you doing here, John? Didn't know anybody could just walk in here and get a story. Well, cooler heads prevail, and Scally says, i got to talk to the president. Very important. So they buy into the story. And she's and here's Brandy over there trying to say, oh, she's a, he's a spy. Hey, Scally had been contacted by a Soviet journalist by the name of Alexander Fulman. And really, this guy was not a Soviet journalist. He was a spy in the United States serving or portraying himself as a journalist. Okay, he's really a off, he's a KGB officer, which would be the same as an American CIA officer. He's the highest ranking spy in the Soviet Union, Alexander Fulman. And he's posing as a journalist in the United States. And he goes and talks to Scali. They met at a downtown restaurant close to the White House. And Fulman said to Scali, do you have access to the President of the United States? And he did, Scally did have some of the best access. But O'Donnell was just mad that day because he didn't have an appointment. And he said, can you pass a word on to President Kennedy from Premier Khrushchev? So Premier Khrushchev has taken his spy in the United States
to try to get a message to Kennedy without who being involved? The military. The military. So Scali met with Foman, and Foman asked Scali to pass a word to President Kennedy from Premier Khrushchev. And Scali was asked was to ask the Kennedy administration three things. Okay, now we got to, this is important. So Foman, Alexander Foman, meets with Scali at a restaurant in D.C. and asked him if he will pass a word on to President Kennedy from Premier Khrushchev. And they meet, and he tells him three things he wants him to tell President Kennedy. One, would the United States be favorable to the Soviet Union removing their missiles from Cuba under United Nations inspection? These are things that Scalise to ask the Kennedy administration if they would allow. Would the Kennedy administration allow the Soviet Union to remove the missiles under United Nations inspection? Why would they want to do that? Why would the Soviets so want the world to see it? No, no, the Soviets want this. Why would they want the United Nations inspection? So there would be no controversy, controversy miscommunication. They want a non-biased group to, ins to remove the missiles so that there wasn't, shh, so there wasn't United States lies about it, so to speak. So Scali was asked the Kennedy administration if they would allow the Soviet Union to remove the missiles under UN inspection. Scali was, at, was to ask the Kennedy administration if they would allow the missiles to be returned to Russia. They would take the missiles out that they wanted them. Okay. Would the Kennedy administration allow the missiles to be returned to Russia? If they would allow those two things, they would dismantle the construction pads in Cuba. So the Soviet Union's offering to remove the missiles, but they want them out, out under UN inspection. They're offering to remove the missiles if they allow, if we allow them to take them home. And they're saying they will dismantle the construction missile pads. But they're going to want something from the United States in return, but not missiles in Turkey. What are what is Khrushchev going to want to guarantee from the United States of what if they agree to do this? Not going to invade Cuba. That they would yeah. never invade Cuba, but that's but that's but that's coming, okay? So Scali goes to the Kennedy administration and passes the word from Foman, which really came from Khrushchev, to Kennedy. This is what we'll do if you promise never to invade Cuba. Well, I'm telling you that Bo the pre President Kennedy and Bobby and his close advisors could not believe it, honestly. But it was for the it was the first step of the two powerful leaders speaking privately. So Scali left the meeting and met privately then with President Kennedy and Scali informed President Kennedy that he only had three hours before he was going to meet with Fulman again. So the President had to get back with him within three hours and let him know whether the United States would be favorable to that offer. And Kennedy told Scali he'd get back to him in a couple hours. Now, as you're thinking about this offer, what would be the one thing in your mind you might be thinking? Is this legit? Is this legit? How does Foman know Khrushchev? Is this, is this a ploy? Are we getting set up to read something we shouldn't? Is this legit? So before Kennedy made up his mind whether he would accept those terms, he had to find out if Foman was legit and if he indeed knew Khrushchev. He had to know if they had any relationship. So he sent... Kenneth O'Donnell to the FBI building to try to dig up as much information as he could on Alexander Fulman. Yeah. They, they can't call Khrushchev. No, it's not, it doesn't work like that. No, it's, technology's not like that. Yeah. Oh. They're sending messages back and forth. Crazy to each other. Yeah, kind of. Most, yeah. And that's going to be key, because all this stuff, when you get to the end of this, it's all going to be key. So O'Donnell goes to the FBI building to try and dig up some information. He can't find anything in Foman's file that ties he and Khrushchev together. So whose file does he dig into next? Scalia. Who? What'd you say? Khrushchev's. And when he digs into Khrushchev's file, he finds the connection he needs. The two Soviets served together in war and were war buddies. They were friends. And once O'Donnell found that connection, he immediately went back to the White House and told President Kennedy that they did indeed know each other, 
They were war buddies. Now again, Kennedy's a little bit apprehensive, and he said, he said to Kenneth O'Donnell, what's your thought? Is it enough? Is it enough to go on this? Do we think, you know, they're legit and they know each other? And O'Donnell responded to the president saying, quote, my gut's telling me Khrushchev is turning to an old friend to carry his message. And Kennedy agreed, brought Scali back in, and informed him they would be favorable to that deal. So Scali then relayed this information to Fulman. Now, Fulman, as you said, isn't going to get on the phone and call Khrushchev and tell him, hey, they're going for it. <laughs> Fulman would have 48 hours to relay the details to Premier Khrushchev and then have an answer back to the United States. That's all the time window they had, 48 hours. Okay? They actually went a little quicker than that. Now this... <clears throat> now, on the 26th, we actually re received a letter from Khrushchev in which he... Uh, this is really important. Kennedy received a letter from Khrushchev late that day in which Khrushchev offered to remove the missiles and missile launching pads in Cuba in exchange for lifting the quarantine zone and a pledge that the United States would not invade Cuba. So that letter was sent. Um, it's it's going to confuse you, but it's going to make sense. That letter was sent the same day that Fulman was to go back and see if Khrushchev was okay with all this, right? But the same day that Fulman was talked to, Khrushchev offered to remove the missiles and missile launching pads in Cuba in exchange for lifting the quarantine zone and a pledge that the United States would not invade Cuba. Is that similar to the offer that Scali gave the president? Mm -hmm. Okay, so keep that in mind. So that ends Friday, October 26th, and we move on to the 27th, which is going to be really quite interesting. When did Kennedy receive that letter I just talked about? Friday, the 26th. The next day, on the 27th, Kennedy received another letter from Khrushchev. Just bang, bang, one letter than another. This one, however, was much different than the first one he received. So he receives a letter saying that they will take out the missiles and missile launching pads in exchange for the dropping of the quarantine line and promising never to invade, right? Mm -hmm. The letter that they received Saturday morning states that the Soviet Union would only remove the missiles and missile sites in Cuba if we agreed to remove our missiles in Turkey. Turkey. What would your thought process be there? You, if you were XCOM, you get this letter Friday, less than 24 late hours later you get another letter that's basically the opposite. What would be your first thought? Good, good. What two different people? No, who wrote the first one? Military. Okay, who probably wrote the second one? Military. Which military? Yes. military? Soviet military, which means what has happened in Cuba? Military. You have had a coup. You have had a coup. You've had an overthrowing of Castro. That's XCOMs and the military's first thought. If we get this letter yesterday, and this letter today, there's probably been a military coup in the Soviet Union, and the second letter's coming from, not Khrushchev, but the military. Maybe he was forced to write it, who knows. So we're right back in panic mode again. Now, if the military was giving this newest ultimatum, this is a whole new scenario if Khrushchev's not in power, because the deal we made through the journalists is what? Void, basically. <coughs> now, President Kennedy also received word that the Soviets had implemented a crash program in Cuba to try to get those missiles operational, ASAP. And we didn't quit these low-level flights, right? And we got more pictures. And these more pictures that we got said that there were some missiles already operational and within 36 hours all of them were going to be operational. 
So Kennedy gets a second letter asking that we remove our missiles in Turkey, which we are not going to do publicly. We'll get into that later. And he'd think there's a military coup, and now we're finding out that the, op the missile sites and missiles are operational. Some are, and within 36 hours, the rest will be. Well, what do you think Secretary of Defense McNamara thinks we should do? Um, not yet. He says, he's, remember, he's, that's good though, he's conservative. He said, Mr. President, I think we need to issue pre-invasion orders to all American military forces, which means that we are preparing to invade. We are ready to go as soon as he snaps his finger. Now, General LeMay informs the President that the Soviets have deployed battlefield nuclear weapons to Cuba. Okay? These weapons were known as frogs. These were Soviet battlefield nuclear weapons. Now what they were, they were short-range nuclear weapons that would be used on American troops if we invaded. They had them already in Cuba. They found that out through surveillance, that they had frogs in Cuba. And frogs were a nuclear tactical weapon that if we did, inv did invade and our troops hit the ground in Cuba, they would be used on our troops. So, what does the military want now, right now? They want airstrike immediately with invasion. Because, LeMay said it best, the longer we wait, the harder it's going to get. So, President Kennedy had no choice at this point. No choice. What day are we on here? 12. No. Okay. General, General Maxwell Taylor was told by the President that the morning of Monday, October 29th, we would initiate full air strikes on Cuba, followed by full invasion. He told him the pre-invasion orders were, were given that McNamara suggested, and President Kennedy ordered General Maxwell Taylor to prepare the military to, ex to execute the airstrikes strikes the morning of Monday, October 29th, followed by invasion. Now, what are we going to need to know now before we have the airstrikes? What? No, not so much. What? No, we know it's true. We're going to war Monday morning. We're kicking ass and taking names. Anyway, we've had enough of this, right? I mean, seriously. And the military is all excited, man. They're frothing at the mouth. They're so doggone excited. But what does the military need to have the airstrikes? We are no, none of that. They got everything they need. They're going Monday. But what do they need? Why? Why are we waiting till Monday? What do they need? Coordinates. They need coordinates. They need to know where the targets are. How are they going to get those coordinates? Fly over. They're going to have another U-2 flight. Okay, a new U-2 flight. So, as a result of the president's permission to allow further U-2 missions, Kenneth O'Donnell again gets on the telephone to talk to a pilot. The pilot that's going to initiate this flight, which will not be as low level, it'll be higher up because they're just picking targets, you see what I mean? And so the pilot of this particular flight was Major Rudolph Anderson. So after Kennedy gives pre-invasion orders and tells the military we're going to war Monday morning, they need U-2 flights, and as a result of that decision, O'Donnell gets on the phone to talk to a pilot. This time he talks with Major Rudolph Anderson. Here is the discussion between the two. O'Donnell stated to Anderson the following, quote, Major, my name is Kenneth O'Donnell, Special Assistant to the President. Major, a few days ago the President ordered me to help him keep control of what is going on out there. I've been browbeating pilots and Navy guys left and right to make sure you don't get us here in Washington into trouble. But you know what? We're pretty damn good ourselves at getting into trouble, so instead of riding your ass, I'm just going to tell you what's going on here and let you figure out how best to help us up there. A lot of things are going wrong today and it's making everyone nervous. The more things go wrong, people become more nervous and it will be very hard to avoid war. Anderson again, just like Ecker, wasn't sure what he was getting at. And he asked O'Donnell, you know, what exactly do you want of me, sir? And he says, don't get shot down. And he went on to listen to Anderson as he talked about the dangers of his mission and there was no guarantee what was going to happen. And, and O'Donnell said, Major Anderson, are you a religious man? And 
Major Anderson said, yes, I am, sir. And he goes, good. Okay? I will tell you tomorrow what happened with the flights. Okay? Hey, we're getting close. We'll be, we might be done. We know class Friday, so this is the end of it here. Tomorrow's it. Then we got to continue on the next week, so we won't get to the video until next week.